beginning in 1982, recapping the events of the original Evil Dead, showing Ash throwing the Book of the Dead into a fireplace, dissolving the possessed bodies of Scotty and Cheryl as a result. And as Ash exits the cabin, we get the viewpoint of an unseen force going through the woods and breaking through the front doors of the cabin from the inside. And we are left with the final scream of Ashley Williams before the screen cuts the black and we jump to seeing an ambulance along with the police cleaning up the aftermath of the events of the first film. We glance over the cabin. We see the dissolved remains of Cheryl, Scotty, Linda, and Shelley, as well as the dismembered corpse of Ash. As police tape off the premises, a faint voice can be heard deep in the woods. Join us. To which a cop shrugs off as being nothing but either the wind or his mind playing tricks on him and continues to turn the area into a crime scene. As a coroner arrives, we get exposition as what they think may have happened before loading up the remains of each body or as much as they can gather and taking them away. As the authorities clear the area, we see the charred remains of the Natrum de Montos still in the now extinguished but smoking fireplace, beginning to pull the remaining chunks of flesh and streams of blood left over by the bodies towards itself using every bit that was left behind to seemingly heal itself in a similar fashion to Frank from Hellraiser. Or at least as much as it can, reforming the original binding of the book, but still not enough to fully reconstitute itself within its pages. The screen fades to black, focused on the book as we hear flies buzzing and we get the title card the evil dead 2. then we flash forward to present day where the events of the first film have now become a local ghost story to the neighboring towns near the cabin area here we follow a group of friends who are deeply into the paranormal and performing their own amateur ghost hunts in which they are absolutely terrible at. They are eventually told the story about the gruesome murders at the cabin and how some people believe that the killer was never caught and the ghost of the victims still haunt the forest with claims of disembodied voices and screams echoing from the area. As Halloween inches closer by the day, the main characters, Rachel and Marcus, decided to be a good idea to investigate the old cabin as well as the surrounding forest area for themselves, in hopes of possibly finding some form of evidence and at least getting enough online exposure to add some form of credibility to their names, and possibly open the door to finally being taken seriously enough to turn their investigation into a full-out profession. So they recruit the rest of their crew and friends, about five people total, including the main characters, and head for the Nobi cabin on Halloween. On their way, they come across the same destroyed bridge from the first film, still in the same state. Disappointed, the group decides to leave in hopes of possibly finding another way to their destination. Upon turning, they come across a fisherman who tells them about an off-road path big enough to drive their vehicles through that can also lead them to where they want to go. The path 
which is how the police and ambulances got there in 1982. The team follows the fisherman's directions, and after some time, they find the cabin just as the sun is setting, seemingly untouched since the events of the first film, damage and all. The team sets up their base of operations just outside of the front of the cabin in a large tent, testing their equipment before entering and beginning their investigation. The team notices the broken pieces of wood that made up the front and cellar doors, both being completely destroyed. They eventually spot the book still sitting in the fireplace and take pictures of it, as well as recording EVPs to which they seemingly hear an audible whispering when playing back, all while questioning why something like the book was never collected by the authorities as possible evidence, to which it's disregarded as just something that was left behind by someone possibly trying to scare one of their friends after hearing some of the local ghost stories about the cabin. They continue on until they find the Nobi tape player, amazingly still in working condition, but definitely showing some age. They play the same tape of Professor Nobi's translation from the book that Ash and his friends played nearly 40 years ago, causing their equipment to momentarily malfunction and meters to spike off the charts as they capture an EVP of Cheryl's disembodied voice screaming, almost like an echo from the past. Then for a moment, everything shuts down, including their lights, causing a brief panic, only for everything to come back on as if nothing had happened at all. The team decides to take a moment and do a quick equipment check back at their base, assuming maybe some faulty component is the cause, only to find it unmanned by their operator, Joey, who was left outside to watch over the team. Suddenly, a voice can be heard from the darkness. Join us. As trees can also be heard, crackling in the woods, as if their roots are pulling out of the ground. One of the team members checks the vehicle they came in, thinking that Joey is possibly grabbing something from it, maybe a wire or possibly another piece of equipment, but finds no trace of anyone there. As the crew takes a moment to regroup, they notice something. The path they used to get to the cabin has seemingly disappeared with trees now blocking their way that hadn't been there before. The crew, actually excited over this development, decides to begin documenting this finding, only to spot Joey staring back at them from the woods as he is seen walking back beaten and bloody. Marcus immediately runs to him helping him towards the cabin, sitting him on an old couch stained with dried blood. Marcus tries to question Joey, asking what happened. Joey mumbles a few words before Marcus notices a small protrusion under Joey's shirt. Lifting it up, we see that it appears to be a thick, branch that was rammed into his stomach and broken off. Marcus begins to freak out, not knowing what to do. He tries pulling the wood out but is unsuccessful, resulting in Joey screaming and passing out from the pain. Rachel pulls a distraught Marcus away as the other two crew members, Samantha and Teddy, try to check on Joey, coming to the conclusion that he will die if they don't get him to the hospital immediately. They all load him into their vehicle and try to search for a new path back to town while swerving through the forest at ridiculous speeds. 
only to blow a tire out from something off-road and hitting a tree as a result. The crew exits the vehicle to assess the damage. That's when they notice the entire rim is mangled and the tree they just hit appears to be bleeding and sounds as if it's weeping as well. This is all building up and topped off by Joey, who has now opened his eyes and speaking with a strange calmness with familiar words. It's okay. I'm all right now. Marcus checks the wound on his stomach and sees black lines quickly spreading away from it, almost resembling a spider web, causing Marcus to jump back as Joey sits up possessed, and now with the bluish skin cracking and bleeding from random areas, as well as blank, pinkish bloodshot eyes. Marcus tries to talk to Joey as he rises to his feet and begins walking towards Rachel, growling with a twisted smile and a jerkiness in each step. Teddy tries to restrain him, but is tossed aside with ease, as Joey is almost close enough to grab Rachel. A gunshot is heard, and the bullet lands in the side of Joey's head, seemingly killing him. As Rachel looks around, they find that Marcus, who unknowingly to the others, brought a gun with him and fired the shot. Feeling a sense of unease in this moment of silence, Joey rises up again and attacks and kills Samantha as the rest watch in horror. They then retreat and spot a light in the darkness. As the remaining three reach the light, they realize they're back at the cabin. They run inside and immediately begin to fortify the exposed doorway and windows using wood from all over the cabin, grabbing anything useful to help close off any open areas. Suddenly, the unseen force begins flying through the woods towards the cabin as Teddy is in the cellar looking for anything else that would help in their current situation. The entity then nosedives into the dirt and burrows its way through the cellar wall, collapsing the rubble on top of Teddy. Rachel and Marcus hear the wall bursting in a loud scream. After yelling Teddy's name and getting no reply, Marcus and Rachel decide to go into the cellar and find their friend, only to be attacked by the now-possessed Teddy with a rusted old axe. Marcus fights the demon, causing it to drop the axe in the process. Then suddenly, the tape player turns on and Nobi's voice can be heard, saying the only way to kill the demon is with bodily dismemberment. Rachel grabs the axe and decapitates Teddy and immediately hacks at each limb as the demon screams in pain, screeching the words, No! Join us! Leaving a twitching, bloody mess. As Rachel regains her senses, whispers can be barely heard to what sounds like multiple voices. They begin to get louder as now screams from the past can now be heard. Marcus and Rachel react as the sound becomes intolerable until there is silence in an instant, followed by one voice, the voice of Ash. Burn it. Rachel looks at Marcus as he looks down at the severed hand of Teddy, pointing at the book on the floor as the blood is being drawn to it like a magnet. Marcus reaches down to grab it, only for the book to open up on its own and show each page rapidly being reconstructed and inked by the possessed Teddy's flesh and blood. 
Marcus pulls his hand back in fear as a loud banging can be heard on the wooden boards covering the cabin's front doorway. It's Joey. Marcus draws his gun again as Rachel realizes what the voice is referring to. They must burn the book. Only they have no means of creating fire. And Marcus is a bit skeptical, considering the source of information coming from a supernatural entity that could be tricking them. While Rachel's instinct is to trust the voice, Joey, still banging on the wood, begins to break through while Rachel grabs the book and readies her axe. While Marcus aims his gun in anticipation of the oncoming danger, suddenly the banging stops and an eerie silence fills the cabin. Marcus begins walking toward the door to see if Joey is still out there, only to be grabbed by the ankle by Samantha, now possessed as well, dragging him into the darkness of the cellar, seemingly using the entrance created by the entity. Rachel reacts by preparing to attempt a rescue, only for Joey to suddenly burst through the cabin doorway, shattering the barricade. Joey laughs as he inches closer to Rachel, as flashes of light and loud bangs can be heard from the cellar. It sounds as if Marcus had used every single bullet in his gun, catching Joey's attention for a second, allowing Rachel to attack with her axe, burying it in his neck, causing him to drop to the ground, seemingly dead again. Rachel runs over to the cellar entrance and yells for Marcus. There's no response. But when Rachel looks back at Joey's body, she spots a pack of cigarettes slightly sticking out of his jacket pocket, assuming he must have a lighter or matches as well. She enters closer and reaches into his pocket, only barely touching him before the demon reawakens. Rachel, by instinct, kicks the demon back and grabs the axe as she begins hacking at its limbs, much like she did with Teddy, killing it for good. In the process, soaking the lighter that was in his pocket in blood, making it incapable of sparking a flame, at least for now. Rachel tries drying it off before attempting again, but is paused by the pleas of Marcus's voice crying for help from the cellar. Rachel, armed with her axe, enters the cellar with the book in her hand. She eventually finds Marcus beaten and leg broken. The demon seemingly left him after he emptied every round of his gun into its body. Rachel helps Marcus back upstairs and rests him on the same couch. Rachel pulls out the lighter again and finally gets a spark and attempts to burn the book before she is attacked again and thrown to the floor by Samantha. Losing possession of the book as it slides across the floor, the demon slowly walks towards her, laughing and almost growling at the same time. And just when the demon is about to attack, Marcus intervenes. Marcus and the demon wrestle for control, with Marcus eventually getting overpowered with the demon digging its fingers deep into Marcus's wounds, causing him to scream in pain, all while screaming for Rachel to do it. Rachel grabs the book and the lighter and gets a spark, catching the demon's attention, causing it to revert to its human form, pleading with Rachel to not burn the book or they can never come back. Marcus screams again, do it, causing the demon to revert to its demon form again and press its thumbs into Marcus's eye sockets while taunting, how does it feel? As blood pours from both sockets, killing Marcus in the process, but not before 
Rachel recovers the book and sets it ablaze, causing the demon to wither away in a grotesque manner as a faint echo of join us can be heard again, but fading into the distance. While Rachel begins to have a moment of her mind breaking down as she realizes the reality of her situation, the sun is beginning to rise as the entity does once again as well. It sweeps through the forest and through the cabin, much like it did before killing Ash, bearing down on Rachel. But this time, she turns and says yes. And that is my Evil Dead concept for a sequel that sort of reboots the timeline in a similar Halloween 2018 fashion that retcons all of the sequels and builds off of the original first film now i'm i'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions as to why i went some of the ways i did why didn't i include ashmore uh the reason for that is mostly due to bruce campbell saying that he did not want to return for the role he wanted to pretty much pass it pass the whole thing along to new people to come into the franchise now this is one of many concepts that you could do or you could continue on from the tv series the reason i went this route is because if you continue from the tv series with brandy pablo and kelly you're always going to be living in ash's shadow with ash possibly still up to make a return or fans just overall knowing that ash is still out there he's alive why can't we have him my thought process with this was going off the first film that last moment we see ash he dies there is no more ash not in a physical kind of way uh we do have a lot of ash unseen which is where we get things like the nobi tape player coming on by itself ash telling them to burn the book his spirit does haunt the grounds sort of like a supernatural countermeasure to the demonic presence with the way the ending goes was something i never actually got to see and i thought would be a pretty cool way to end it we constantly hear the demons, deadites, whatever you want to call them. I didn't call them deadites yet on here because that's a term that's given in Evil Dead 2 at the end when he goes back to uh, the castle of Kondar. That's pretty much done then. I didn't want to use that term quite yet. So what I ended up doing with this ending was we constantly hear the demons say join us we know most of the human characters their first inclination is to deny like no i don't want to join you but what if we had a character that went through all of the same things that ash did but at the end being so beaten down being so driven to the brink of insanity over the loss of all of her friends the demonic entities that were trying to kill her all because she wanted to get famous from doing ghost hunts what if that broke her to the extent that she gave in and she accepted the demon's invitation and that is possibly how I would set up a sequel. Where do we go from here? Which, I mean, with that, you can go a lot of different places. But I leave it to you guys. Where would you guys go after this story? What would, what would your sequel idea be to this story? Or what would your sequel idea be in general? Comment below. 
And don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, as well as hitting the notification bell to be alerted whenever I do another concept video or another Dark Theories video, or any video for that matter. Be sure to hit those. And as always, I am JG Dark, and thanks for watching. <laughs>